All right. Good morning, folks. We have a special treat here today. We're joined by John Perkins, most famous for his book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, but has written a number of books, both before and after that. We'll get into all that. But John, thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure to be with you, Matthew. All right. So, John, so there's a younger generation on, on YouTube, and they probably, despite the great success of your book, probably don't know much about the history and, and all that. Can you just tell us a little bit about, summarize what what you did, what that book was about, what being an, an economic hitman was all about. Yeah, so uh, my official title was uh, a chief economist at a major consulting firm, Charles D. Main, at the time, major consulting firm. It's since been bought out and the name's changed. But um, but my, my real job was to identify uh, countries with resources our corporations covet, like oil. And, and and what I had up to fifty people working for me doing this also, and then to arrange a huge loan to that country through the World Bank, the IMF, or Inter American Development Bank, or one of those sister organizations. But the money never actually went to the country. Instead, it went to our own corporations to build infrastructure projects in the country. The country was in debt; it had to sign off on the debt. They never see the money. The money went immediately to you know, Halliburton or Brown and Root or Stone and Webster, one of the big engineering firms to build power plants, uh, uh, ports, industrial parks, highways, these infrastructure things that that, that our own co co companies would make a lot of money off of. And these projects helped the rich people in those countries, the ones who owned the industries and the commercial establishments and the banks, and they benefited from more electricity, from better ports, from better highways. But the majority of the people actually suffered because money was diverted from health, education, and other social services to pay off the loans on, on the debt. So it was really this process that as the country became deeper and deeper into debt, we could make these demands on the country. You know, you got to sell your resources real cheap, your oil or whatever, to our corporations without any environmental or social regulations. Uh, you know, you, you, you got to uh, uh, vote with us on the next United Nations vote against Cuba or some such thing. Mm. Let us build a military base on your soil. We were really building an empire, but doing it in a very subtle way without using the military for the most part. But I will say that the, 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 the presidents of these countries had they were faced with a difficult choice because if they accepted the loans, they and their their friends, their family and their friends who who owned the businesses, because they were all pretty much from the wealthy families, would benefit. And we offered them a lot of perks like full scholarships in the United States universities for their kids and things like mm -hmm. that. Basically bribes, but legal bribes, or they knew that in the background people we call the jackals were lurking and these guys had had guns. I didn't carry a gun, but these guys did. And, you know, we, we, the United States has admitted that we were deeply involved, the CIA and the overthrow of President Allende of Chile. And, and he died in that process. And Arbenz of Guatemala and Ziem of Vietnam and uh, the Shah of Iran took, taking over for Mossadegh, you know, throwing Mossadegh out, that was the CIA coup. So these things have happened over and over. And leaders know this. So my job was actually pretty easy to say, hey, take all this money, make our countries, our companies wealthy, sell us your resources at cut rate prices, you and your friends will get rich, or, hmm, <laughs> you know what might happen. <laughs> yeah, and in, in the, one of the great things in this book, you go into this, go through these you, you take readers through your specific experiences in doing all this, and uh, one of the things, you would think that the, uh, it's a crazy story. A lot of people at the time when it came out were even doubting that it was true, I remember, but now it seems like everyone just is, you know, knows. I mean, it's obvious now that that is sort of the, uh, you know, our, the, our economic imperialism almost that the, the U.S. has used for years to kind of, but, but was it done with bad motives? I mean, I mean, I think that's the argument that the other side would have about it or would be that, you know, you're building, you are investing in infrastructure in these countries and that you know, maybe does help and is important. Um, I mean, is there, what, 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 what's the other argument? What's the other side of the argument for doing these well, things? Empires are always built on good causes. 
let's face it, you know, we're going to save the, the infidels from going to hell by making right. them become Catholics or Christians or whatever it is. Uh, you know, where, you know, it, uh, we're, the, the Romans are going to spread enlightenment throughout the world and <laughs> and the darkness of the of the pagans and of the people who are not not romans and th so throughout history it's it's always been that, that that empires think they're doing the right thing and yes i was taught in school business school that uh if you invest a lot of money in, into infrastructure in a poor country the economy grows and it does it could when by the way we measure the economy GDP, gross domestic product, will increase as you invest money in these infrastructure programs. So as I went into this business, I felt I was doing the right thing. I thought I was doing good work, as most people in the business do now. Um, there's people at the top, that they, they know better. And I began to see that I had to know better because what I began to understand is that even though GDP is growing, that only reflects uh, the, the rich people. The, the, the G GDP statistics are very skewed toward the rich. So for example, even in the United States, if you take a case like the United States where there's three individuals that have as much wealth as half the country, if those three individuals made 10% on their assets last year and half the country lost 3%, you would still show an overall growth of almost 4%, between three and 4%. So you, you, you'd be able to statistically to say the country prospered, but the fact of the matter is the country didn't prosper. It suffered. Half the people suffered. And in that particular model, the other, the other half just stayed the same. So I began to see that these statistics are terribly skewed in favor of the rich. They're statistics that are aimed at making uh, the kind of work I, I was doing look good. And yet... We could we could spread the the idea that the economy was growing. We were doing good work because we were we were cre we were increasing GDP, economic growth. Well, you're absolutely right. It seems to me <clears throat> with uh, the way this has worked out, uh, it, it really is rather shameful. But but where do you where do you lay the the blame? I, I presume you're not uh, against development in these countries, the building of dams to give the people electricity and roads. So if they want to get out of their villages and go to the cities, which is a, a double-edged sword, obviously. Uh, so isn't the problem that this was all kind of state money and anything that comes from the state comes from taxpayers' pockets, pockets including the repayment of those loans uh, came out of the local taxpayers' pockets, directly or indirectly. I mean, what's your solution to these problems, uh, John? Well, well, I think, Doug, we have to look at the overall system is one that's driven by a perception that, that the goal of business, and in fact, the goal of all of us, is to maximize short-term materialistic gain. And the, the goal of business is to maximize short-term profits, regardless of the social and environmental costs. Every day we watch the stock market. You know, people talk about the quarterly report, but even the quarterly report is, is, is quarterly, whereas people are, it's every single day. And, and the motivation for this whole system is short-term maximization of profits. And I think that's created something that, that I and a lot of other economists today are beginning to refer to as a death economy, an economic system that's consuming itself into extinction. In the short term, it's using up the resources it needs for the long term. And it's also polluting the, the planet in every single way. It's creating climate change. It's creating income inequality, species extinctions, the, the, the destruction of environments. That's a death economy. And that's what we've created. And it's all created by this perception that what we all want and what we all need is short-term materialistic benefit. Uh, and, and, you know, the solution is to realize that what we really want is a life economy, an economic system that will pay people to clean up pollution, uh, to uh, regenerate destroyed environments, 
to recycle, to create technologies that don't ravage the earth. And well, I think we're in the process of doing that. It's, it is happening. I, I see it happening. You know, we've, this, this, this technology is being developed for, for mining all the plastic that's floating around in the oceans and recycling it. It's in the process, but we're still caught in this old system of maximization of short-term profits. We, we've got, that just doesn't work and it, it, it never worked. Well, the question, part of the question I might have is that uh, profits, there's nothing wrong with profits because profits show that you're creating wealth, you're creating value. Whereas if you have losses, it means you're destroying wealth and the standard of living and, and uh, it goes down. So the problem, I guess, is short-term profits. But um, what's the cause of people going after short-term as opposed to long-term profits? Uh, what's the matter with a, a businessman trying to build a dynasty if, he, if he's of that mind? Uh, you can only do that through long-term profits and planning that way. Is, how do you solve this problem? How do you get from uh, where the dysfunctions, uh, of which there are many today, living in a, what I technically call a fascist economy, which is uh, state corporatism, pretty much like Mussolini described, actually. So how do we get from there to a more sustainable, and I hate to use that word actually, it's become so fashionable. What do you suggest happen? Well, I, I think, I don't know how you define profits, but I'm not sure profits, if, it, if we're talking only about materialistic money profits, I don't think that is a good thing, frankly. I, I think, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time with indigenous cultures Many of them, the, the schwa of Ecuador and, and so on, they don't even have a word for profits. There's a word for benefits. So, you know, how do we maximize benefits? Uh, you can say that cutting a forest, destroying destroying the Amazon rainforest, brings profits to companies that that use the the trees or use whatever the resources they take out. But in the long term you're destroying human life. You're destroying lots of life. You may not actually be destroying the planet, but you're certainly changing it. That's not a profit. And you know, we measure profits today. We, we don't, we, we externalize all these costs, the costs of, of, uh, of, of the environmental destruction. Uh, we, mac, we, we externalize that. We don't include that in people cutting trees, okay, it cost me so much money to buy the land or to lease the land and to send in the, send in the equipment. But in fact, in that is not the cost of what that's doing to the environment, what that's doing to the indigenous cultures. So I think we really have to look at this word profit and, and define what it means. And if we can include all the external costs, if we can internalize them, and if we can really look at what, what do we need for the future, what do our children need? And right now, you know, I've got a 13 year old grandson, he's facing a huge crisis. Uh, what's this world gonna look like when he's my age? And he's very think, aware. What do you think it'll look like? I mean, what, do you have a, a view as to what's likely to happen at this stage, the way things are going, the way you see them? I have a hope that we will stop maximizing short-term profits, that we'll stop creating a death economy and we'll start, we'll be able to pay people like him to do things that clean up pollution and that regenerate destroyed environments. I mean, to me, that, that, that's, that's what's profitable. Well, the, here's, maybe, maybe I can um, crystallize this a little bit more. It's that, uh, for instance, if he's gonna clear, clean up the environment, and there are a lot of things that it would be nice if they were cleared up, there was no question about it. It takes capital to do that. And the way you accumulate capital is by accumulating profits, which add up together to capital. And the problem with, uh, let's say, primitive societies, like the ones that I know that you're very interested in, in Central America, is that they don't have any capital. So they, except for Westerners giving them outside tools and technologies, all they basically have is Stone Age sticks and stones. So they, they're not in a position to uh, really clean. How do you do this, in other words, from a practical matter? Because people don't want to go backwards. And uh, we like our conveniences that we have in the West, good or bad. We like them. So how do you, how do you accomplish this? Because it it's going to take a lot of capital. 
devoted in this way? And what if a lot of people don't aren't interested in that? I mean, I, th I think in many ways you're very enlightened, uh, but not everybody thinks that way. So what do you do about those people? Well, Doug, what, 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 how do you define capital? It's uh, usable wealth. Uh, it's um, machinery, it's technology, it's resources that can be accessed. It's not so money. Actually, so it's so not actually the, people, money per se. the people of South America, the people of Africa have the most capital in the world. They have the most resources and they're the poorest people in the world. They have the capital and they're poor. So it's, it's, it's not a question of capital. No, I added, I, John, I added on a, a key word at the end of that, that, that can be accessed. Well, th theirs can be accessed. The problem is that we've created a system that, that uses people like me or militaries to go in and use the capital in the ways that we figure is best without helping the people that actually live on the capital. We could say own the capital, uh, but are there have been the long-term stewards of the capital? So you know the rainforests have survived very, very well. And, and, and you know the rainforests of South America, where I spend a lot of time, that that's as big as the continental United States, the Amazon rainforest. It's done very well until recently, until our greed for what you're calling capital goes in and starts destroying it and destroying the indigenous cultures in the process. They use that capital very wisely. They survive, they live very good lives. You can talk about Stone Age. Well, they're way beyond that. They're, they're not hunters and gatherers. They're, they've always been agronomists. We haven't recognized how incredibly good they were at agronomy, at, at managing the forest, at, at managing the resources of the forest. Um, so I, I think we really have to look at how the systems have evolved that have allowed a few people, relatively speaking, on this planet to dominate the resources that are should be available to everyone. Well, I'm not for a few people dominating things. Uh, most of, in fact, in today's world, a lot of those the resources that these few people have uh, amount to, uh, to stolen wealth, in other words, taken by coercion at the point of a gun. So, but there have always been a few people on top that have controlled everything. They used to be kings or pharaohs or princes. And, and today they're, uh, they, they style themselves masters of the universe and they're in New York and high rises. So, you know, I, I guess it comes down to the fact that we're basically monkeys and uh, we live in packs and it's hierarchical. But uh, here's the problem that I'd like you to speak to, if you would. I see the problem as being institutionalized coercion in society. And I'm sure you're against coercion. Would I be correct? Yes. Okay. And the problem is that the state is institutionalized coercion. It's the essence of the state. It's the only entity in society that has a right to hold a gun to your head and extract half of what you earn. Or if you're trying to save capital in the form of money, uh, can inflate it away through central banks. Uh, it can tell you what to do, what not to do, these people at top. And uh, a lot of these uh, distortions and tragedies that, that you discuss very eloquently, incidentally, in this book, uh, I lay at the foot of the state uh, and it's using coercion. I mean, do you have a feeling about that? Well, I think we have to ask ourselves who, who owns, who runs the state? And it's, a, you know, in my opinion, in, much of the world, including the United States, it's the big corporations. Nobody can be elected to a, a high office in the United States without support from corporations or the, the, the stockholders of the corporations. Um, so, you know, if you define, if you look at the definition of capitalism, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a system where the means of production and distribution are not owned by the state, they're owned by individuals. Yes. That's part of the definition. And then you get into this, this competition and so forth. Well, we've kind of turned that on our, on its head in the United States where 
where, where the state does not own the means of production, it's owned primarily by individuals, uh, by corporations, but they own the state. They, they own the government to a very large degree. They have tremendous influence. And the bigger the corporation, the more powerful, the greater the influence they have. So, so they are coercing the state to coerce the rest of us uh, oh. to do things that benefit to benefit the big corporations. You're absolutely right. We, I, we're, we're in total agreement. But uh, the good thing about corporations, for all their faults, is that uh, without the state, they really can't hold a gun to your head and tell you what to do. They can offer you a job. You can take it or leave it. Uh, they can create a product. You can buy it or not buy it. But it's only when they get hooked up with the state that uh, they can make laws that uh, change the So the state is the essential problem. And the fact is that the corporations have indeed captured it. You're right. But the problem is still the state, I think. The entity. The yeah, you, by death, but by definition, you're saying that the state is the corporations. And so, yeah. Well, it's been captured, the two, by, but, but captured I call, by the corporations. Captured what I, it's what I call the corporatocracy, which yeah. is which is the combination there. And you almost can't tell the difference. So who, 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 who sits in high positions in government? Who, can, who sits in parts of the government that control the oil companies? It's almost always former oil executives who will go back into the oil industry, the revolving door, very famous, you know what I mean? You know, right, we, you're right, in every industry, in every industry and the regulatory apparatus has been totally captured by the corporations. But what I'm saying is, is that only the state has the power to do things to you as, as the government, that only it can exert force per se. The corporations, you can buy, sell, work for them or not, but it's the fact they've captured the state and the state therefore is the uh, hinge. It's the problem. The corporations are just doing, you know, what living entities always do, try to get bigger and that's, Everybody does well, that as individual. I, I, I think that's true in certain states. It certainly isn't true in the United States, where right now we're seeing that the state, uh, who's the state? Is it is it Biden who wants to impose a mandatory vaccination? Or is it the Congress that, that resists that? And and we've had we have a Congress that can't make any decisions right now, it seems like, because it's it's, it's split between Republicans and Democrats. And they are so far apart and they can't seem to figure out how to compromise. So what, what's the state? The state, well, state, state could be Pfizer, and based upon what you guys were talking about, yes, you know, earlier. I would agree with you. I think that I think you got you got a lot more power in the corporations. Facebook, Amazon, Pfizer; these companies have a lot more power than Biden does, or 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 Mitch McConnell. <laughs> I don't know who the state is in the, in the United States. It's what I call the corporatocracy, and there is a consensus there that even competitors, <clears throat> so let's say Exxon and, and Chevron may compete for your dollar at the gas pump, but if Congress tries to impose some rules that will in any way affect their ability, the oil company's abilities to make profits, they will come together. Yes, they will. Uh, to fight that, there's a tremendous power there. And, and as, as we all know right now, there's tremendous power and those who control the media, and, and especially the you know the, the, the social media that we ha have today, yeah. Hmm. Well, anyway, I'm just I'm just making a case against against coercion and being able to legally force people to do things or not. But let's let's leave for the leave the U.S. for a moment. What do you think about China's uh, Belt and Road Plan? It seems to me uh, that. Uh, it's pretty much going to amount to the same thing that the corporations have arrived at here. What do you, uh, how do you, how do you? Yes, I agree. That? You know, that's the book I'm writing right now is on China's economic hitmen. Uh, they're using the same model that we use, except they're doing a lot better job of it. Frankly, they, they've learned from our mistakes and they've learned from our successes. And, but basically they're, they're doing something very similar. And the Belt and Road Initiative is a brilliant tool. <laughs> I wish I wish I'd thought of it, you know, uh, to reach out to the world. Because in essence, if I went to a country like Ecuador, <clears throat> where I where I spent a lot of time as an economic hit man, uh, 
I would say, so look, take these big loans from us, build these big hydroelectric dams and increase your economy and, and, and support us. You have the United States and Ecuador will have a special relationship at the United Nations and elsewhere. There'll be this bilateral relationship. Well, China says, uh, take all this money from us to pay our companies uh, to build big hydroelectric dams, just like with the Americans. But in the process, we're also building a belt and road, a new silk road that will connect you with Peru and Colombia and Brazil, and even with Nigeria and, Thai and, 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 and Thailand. Uh, we're we're going to connect you, Ecuador, with the whole world commercially. And incidentally, look at our model. We brought 800 million people out of poverty in 30 years. Uh, and our, we had economic growth, of, uh, we had double digit economic growth for three decades. Uh, the United States can't, can't can't offer you anything like that. They don't have a model like that. We've got this great model and we're gonna help connect you with the whole world. They're presenting this as not a bilateral relationship between Ecuador and China, but rather as a way to help bring Ecuador into a huge commercial network. That's the, that's the, that's the perception. That's what they're yes. selling. Yes. And, and yet in the long run, I think they're, they're just, they're, they're just they're, they've got an amazing, They've got an amazing marketing tool here, amazing selling tool. And in, in the, and in the process of doing that, they really have taken over Latin America and Africa. They are the number one investor in both those continents. Uh, they're, they're the number one trader with both of those continents now. They've replaced the United States. I've heard it said, uh, and I believe it was by a, a very high up Chinese official years ago, that ultimately they want to export several hundred million people to Africa. Have you picked up on that or not? Well, they are exporting a lot of people to Africa and Latin America workers. So when they, so right now, you know, they've got projects like a, a huge mine in, 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 the, in, the, in the Ecuadorian Amazon, where it's been estimated there's over a thousand Chinese laborers there mm. who once, once they finish their laboring will probably be left in Ecuador and there'll probably be an arrangement for those people to be integrated into Ecuador. And that's happening in countries throughout Latin America and Africa and, and other parts of the world. So yeah, they're very, very much in that process. That's what I've, that's what I've seen too. And, and this is part of the, the great worldwide migrations that are taking place now. I'm of the opinion that there are going to be tens of millions or scores of millions of Sub-Saharan Africans that are going to move to Europe. If I was a young Nigerian, I'd try to get to Europe at any cost. So what's what's the effect of all this going to be on on the world? Because I think it's happening. Would you would you agree? Yes, I agree it's happening. It's happening for many reasons. You know, one of them is the oppression in some of these countries, and one of them is climate change. And and one of them is is the, the dream of, of getting a better life by, by you know coming to the United States or going to Europe. Uh, so there's, there's all these factors driving that. And, and certainly climate change, I think, will become an increasingly important factor in that. Well, climate change happens. You know, I, uh, it's been changing for four and a half billion years, and it'll keep changing. I guess the question is whether it's ant anthropogenic in, in nature. And I think that's where the main controver controversy on this is. And well, Doug, I don't, I don't hear much controversy about that anymore. There was few years ago, but today the scientific evidence is overwhelming. And well, just, we, just, just reasonably thinking reasonably as, as we burn all these fuels, as we create all this pollution, as we, as we, as we ravage the planet, how can, how can we not admit that we have, we have had a huge impact on the nature of the planet we live on? We've had a oh, huge no, impact. No question about it. I mean, at this point, we're in a position where if we wanted to, we could we got to define who we is, of course, that's always dangerous, uh, but we could pave the planet and that would definitely change things, no question about it. But at the same time, uh, a very large volcanic eruption can emit more CO2, which I guess has replaced plutonium and sulfur and a number of other elements in the periodic table as being the uh, carbon, uh, as being the death element. But, uh, uh, you know, you've heard George Carlin's skit on uh, humans and the planet, that eventually the planet's going to shake off humans like a dog does, fleas. 
that's that's in the long term. We've only been around for 5,000 years. I'm not sure we will be 5,000 years from now, but... Uh, we, 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 we've, been, we, we, we've been around for 250,000 years. Oh, as, civil, as a civilization, civil, in civilized form, I meant. Yes, but I think it's an important distinction because during most of those 250,000 years, we understood that we were a part of nature. And it's only been within the last few thousand or a hundred or even the, especially the last tough few decades where we've defined oh, ourselves yeah. as being apart from nature. Yeah. Uh, we have the right to change the climate. And, you know, I, I just have to say that I, t I speak at a lot of universities and colleges and 20 years ago when Confessions of an Economic came out in 2004, uh, there was a lot of controversy in the colleges about is climate change caused by humans? Today, I don't know any college students that even will have that discussion. I, I agree, it, you're totally correct, but so no, they, they, they know they, they, they just they know that we are causing the problems. Well, yeah, it's but science and of course science itself is being debunked and debased. And when I talk about science these days, I usually put the science in quotation marks because it's uh, everything is being highly politicized today. Everything is, is politicized, medicine, other areas of science, and you don't know really what to believe. And, and we all kind of find ourselves in silos. And the silo, at least that I'm in, is very different from that on college campuses because you've noticed this, I'm sure, uh, moving uh, in those circles that uh, the reigning philosophy is basically a form of neo-Marxism has, has taken over. I mean, the, the kids today are indoctrinated to be very statist and very collectivist and uh, very Marxist uh, in outlook. And I, so I actually, I don't, I don't believe, I believe in climate change, but uh, I think the odds of our having another ice age are as good as we get more global warming uh, in the next hundred years, but that's a, that's what you would call a contrary opinion. <laughs> okay. So I, I so I have a question about the the, uh, the the these big migrations we see happening, especially like right now. You know, there's with we see in the news this with these Haitians that are you know on you know amassed on the border. You know, and I wonder if it's how how much of the uh, this hitman model really is has driven that to happen because it's not just you know there's the destruction of the local economies i mean haiti's been sort of this messed with by uh outsiders for a long time a long long time uh, but i just wonder how much would you attribute the the migration scenario we see now all across the world to kind of the messing with uh these the, these local economies essentially through debt yeah, I, that's a that's a really good question, and that uh, I, I, um, I think if we take Central America right now, uh, Haiti is a little separate. It's a small island. It's it's been <coughs> strongly influenced by it has the French still claim it owes them <laughs> I don't know billions of dollars I guess, but Central America is a really interesting point because uh, basically. Our policies of the United States have destroyed the economies of Central America. I spend a lot of time in Central America every year. I spend time, I teach, I teach in Costa Rica and uh, in, um, in Guatemala and uh, Mexico. So I've, I've, I'm very familiar with what's going on in, in those countries. And you know some of the policies like NAFTA and CAFTA and, and so forth that have established that you can't um, impose taxes or tariffs on imports or exports, but it says nothing about subsidies. So here's mm -hmm. an example um, that a corn farmer or a cotton farmer in let's say Guatemala, and I'm just gonna throw out some numbers as they're not real numbers, but we'll use them as an example. Let's say it costs a, a, a farmer in Guatemala $10 to produce a bushel of corn. And it costs a farmer in the United States $12 to produce that bushel of corn. But the, and they can't impose any tariffs. 
So the United States farmer can't sell in Guatemala and Guatemala farmers could make a lot of money by selling to the United States, but the United States subsidizes corn. So the, the US farmer really only, it really only costs him maybe $6 <laughs> to mm. produce that bushel of corn. It actually costs him $12, but he's being reimbursed, let's say six. And so our corn and cotton and many other products are flooding Central America. And uh, the Central American farmers can no longer make a living, putting them out of business. Mm. Uh, and, and that's just one example. And, and then on top of that, there are the brutal dictatorships many of which are very strongly supported uh, by the CIA. Uh, and, and so I think for us, we need to look at Central America as being a place where um, we could, we, I think the, pro the, the way to stop the immigration problem is to really help the economies of those countries and especially help the local economies where, where the small farmer can make a living and live a good life. I speak Spanish fluently. I talk to the people who come here from Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras to work here. They don't want to be here. They they work very very hard and they and they and they live under pretty tough conditions here. Fifteen of them in a small room, you know. They work hard and they send their money home to their families. What they can, what they can can possibly eke out to send home. Guatemala is a beautiful country. Honduras, El Salvador. They would much rather be there. They just can't make a living there. And I think if we change some of our policies here and recognize that the way to solve the immigration problem is to help the economies of those countries sustain the, the, the small farmer or the, or the laborer to create jobs for people in those countries, uh, that could be extremely successful. Well, I think, and I know Doug's having some connection problems, it appears, but I, I, I think Doug's rebuttal to that would be, not rebuttal exactly, but that he would say, well, that, that if you, don't allow those subsidies to exist, you know, then, then those the farmers, the local farmers can compete and they don't get destroyed by, you know, this, the U.S. giant ag businesses that are, you know, that are effectively subsidized. So I guess it's, that, that, that's what, his, what he would probably say about that. What do you think? Well, it, I think, isn't that what I was saying? Well, yeah, well, you said, well, you said, you said help the local farmers be successful, but it's almost like, uh, I guess the, uh, it's instead of doing something new in addition, it would be removing some restriction or some, you know, uh, some unnatural influence on the economy that exists now through subsidies. Oh, yeah. So to get rid of the subsidies in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that could do it, too. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Yeah, good luck with that. What, poli what politician is going to take on the ag business? Right. Know, I'm, I'm, big, I'm, big from, I'm from I'm from Iowa, so I can tell you those. Uh, the, you know, it's really hard to get past the corn lobby. Uh, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, and you know, and that gets back to what we were talking about originally: the power of the big corporations in this country. Uh, yeah. They have to 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 do that. So if you if you're trying to deal with the immigration problem uh, you, you know you've got you're up against uh, companies that that really really are benefiting from the the, the current uh, policies that we have which is also driving immigration right and i think that's exactly what doug would say about this the the you know he boils probably the problem down to the the state's power that they have and if you if you if the state is not you know uh subsidizing certain industries or whatever that then that would you know you allow you know normal trade to take place. I mean, real economic, you know, value to be exchanged rather than being, you know, the scales tipped essentially by the big corporations with the government power. Right, right. And that's again, it's, it's corporations that are driving the government's policies. Right, that's true. No doubt. I'm sorry, but my internet here. This is further proof that uh, the U.S. is turning into a third world country. We can't even maintain a stable internet connection. Yeah. <laughs> I think, Doug, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head there that, that that is what's happening to us. And China's certainly recognizing that and, and pushing it more and more and more to, you know, I, I, I remember uh, I taught at, a, at, a, at an MBA program in, in China to Chinese students a few years ago. And, and I remember one of, one of the students raising his hands, he says, <laughs> he says, Mr. Perkins, do you think that the United States is the world's largest banana republic that doesn't have bananas? <laughs> An astute question. Uh, 
the, the direction the US has been going in is just very disturbing. The only thing that seems to work in this country anymore is the military, which is giant and bloated and very dangerous unnecessarily oh. 10 times larger than it has any reason or right to be, frankly. Yes, and, and when you say they work, I don't think they work very well in Afghanistan. No, no, that's very, but they're the, but they're the best, they're the most trusted part of the US government, which is- Well, as an institution, as an institution, they seem to be, they seem to be able to make decisions and do things, but they don't seem to be very effective when they do them, if we can judge from Vietnam and, and Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, we've, We've really got to look at this. It, it seems to me that somehow there's got to be something that's between um, a so-called democracy uh, that can't get anything done and an autocracy like China that seems to get everything done, but also has you know some, such draconian policies that none of us would want to live under. I wouldn't want to live under the Chinese policies, and yet they're certainly very effective. On the other hand, the United States, I like the freedom of the press. I like that we're able to talk like this. I like that I'm able to publish a book that's pretty critical of our government. <laughs> I, I like all that, but I don't like the fact that our government can't seem to get anything done. Mm. But, but once again, the government has become hugely powerful uh, over the last, well, let's say, when did this really start? I'd say around the time of McKinley and Teddy Roosevelt, when the US government started reaching out to create an empire with the Spanish-American War and uh, you know, finished the conquest of the Indians, basically stealing the land from them, to be quite candid. Uh, and, and now the US government just about totally controls the economy. So, um, I, I don't. I don't see that. Doug. More Doug, I, 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 I got to disagree with you. I don't think the U.S. government does control the economy. I, I think it's. I, I just don't see that. I, I can't see the U.S. government getting anything done. We we couldn't get out of out of Afghanistan in a, in a good way. Uh, we we can't we can't handle the virus. We we're, we're 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 way above the numbers of Europe and many other parts of the world in terms of the virus. We can't make a decision as to how to where to invest our money. We can't. We're, we're about to go over the budget. We can't. We can't balance the budget in our Congress. Uh, we can't build our infrastructure. Uh, we can't seem to deal with many of the crises we're facing. And uh, so, I, I would agree with you that there was a time. Uh, you may go back to McKinley, and certainly under. Under Reagan, the government had tremendous control. The Reagan Reaganomics and the, the trickle down uh, was was extremely controlling, uh, but I don't see that anymore. I, it seems to me that our government has become very ineffective, and the corporations really, in such a huge way, are controlling things. We may think we have freedom of the press, and I can publish a book, like I can write and criticize the government, but if 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 Zuckerberg doesn't like what I've got to say, he can shut me down in many, many ways. I can still publish the book, but nobody's ever going to hear about the book. Uh, it, before we got on this program, Matthew was mentioning that he, he just only recently became aware that I published a book called Touching the Jaguar a year ago. It came out in, over a year ago in June. Uh, and uh, but one of the reasons he <laughs> didn't hear about it is because uh, it, it, you know, it, it kind of actually kind of gets shut down. And I don't know whether that was intentional or whether just because of the pandemic and, and it was overrun by uh, media interest in the pandemic and in the elections and in Black Lives Matter. So a lot of other things came into play. But the fact of the matter is, like never before, uh, a couple of individuals control the media. We, we used to think, you know, Hearst had a lot of power to control the newspapers. Well, he did. But not like today, where every, but social media is so controlling. And Hearst newspapers, you know, you bought the newspaper. And it didn't matter whether you were right wing or left wing or not. You either bought the paper or you didn't. It, it, your ideas were not reinforced through it. But today, you know, if you're right wing, you're going to get all the right wing news <laughs> on social media. If you're left wing, you're going to get all the left wing news. I think I wish it were the opposite. You know, I think we should be. That's democracy would 
would help us if we were truly looking at democracy and if we were looking at the democratization of the media, uh, we, would be, we would be encouraging it to present us with opposite viewpoints from what we, we think we, we believe. You know, that's the dialogue, that's Socrates. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's the way that we advance as a country is by accepting information that isn't necessarily part of the choir that we sing in. We, we, we get to hear the other choir. Yeah, I think that's really important. I, 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 sorry, Doug, go ahead. He's breaking up on me. Yeah. Sorry, Doug, your connections. There you go. We lost him. But uh, so your book, your new book that did come out last year, though, it from from what I have been able to gather and just reading uh, about it. Um, and I'm like I said, it, I, it's the next book I'm going to read. But it is it's it's called Touching the Jaguar. And it is a different it's more uh, solutions oriented versus exposing the problems of, of ec the economic hitmen. Right. Well, it's really saying so the, the, the phrase touching the Jaguar comes from a a shaman that I, I studied with back in 1968, 69 in the Amazon when I was in the Peace Corps. And he said, you know, we know that if you confront something, if, 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 if there's something that's holding you back that you don't understand or that's scaring you like a jaguar uh, you, it, and you run from it, it'll chase you. But if you confront it, uh, you take its power. And so, I think it's very tied in with what we're talking about right now, uh, that we are, we're at, a, we're at a time right now where we've got these, we know we're being confronted by huge, huge problems. We know climate change is happening. We know the oceans are rising. We know the glaciers are melting. We know there's fires and tornadoes and hurricanes increasingly. We know that, that nature is being destroyed. We know that the rainforest, I mean, we know that all the, the, the important environments are being destroyed and species are going extinct. And there's a huge problem of, in, of income and in, in racial inequality and, and so on and so forth. We know these things are happening. And it's time we, we really dug into touching them, going out and saying, what is the real problem? What's driving this? And I would maintain, <laughs> you know, there is a relatively simple answer to that. It's not necessarily an easy solution, though. The, the simple answer is that it's a death economy. It's an economic system that maximize, maximizes the, ravages, the ravaging of resources, including people, uh, in the short term uh, in order to maximize profits. And it's basically destroying our long-term potential by being so fo focused on on short term maximization of material goods, you know, I think I I think uh, Doug and I have talked about something with uh, another episodes we've done something similar, and that my worry is that people people do seem clearly to me to be almost uh, operating in a version of game theory where it's like I do something based upon whether or not I get punished or rewarded in the in the very near term in some in some form that's measurable and that I guess that is what this material I mean uh, material some material almost some probably financial way is the easiest way to measure and to know so then people end up making these bad choices over and over again without any concern for the long term and I, I agree with that totally actually I mean I think that I, I I worry that people don't believe in the future anymore that we're all I mean they don't believe that they're not there no one's constructing any you know building anything like you 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 know, you're, you're in a cabin that you said was built by your grandfather, um, you know, and, and it's like he, the, the effort and energy and, and capital and resources that he took into building it was, you know, he had to be thinking about something in the future and thank goodness he did because you're able to enjoy it today because, because he did that. He was thinking about the future and it does seem that that there's a lack of that everywhere. Is that, is that, do you agree with that? I mean, is that a fair yeah. assessment of your view? Yeah, I totally agree, and even to the point where I, I have an, a, an assistant who's a, who's a college student, a young woman who's a college student, and, and she recently wrote, wrote a guest uh, newsletter. I do a newsletter once a month, and, 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 and she says, you know, one of the problems with her generation, including hers, is a lack of hope in the future. Yes. They don't, don't want to think about the future because it's too scary. Um, and I, I do think that that's, that's out there. Very much so. 
I would be terrified, I think, if I were 20 years old right now, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, and, and I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm living in this cabin in the woods of New Hampshire that my, and on the lake that my grandfather built 100 years ago. It's quite primitive, and, but it's also very close to Dartmouth College, and I hang out over there quite a lot. I've, I've, I've lectured there, and, and I love the sports events that they have, and I talk to some of the college students, and, and I, I've, you know, just the, just a couple of days ago, I was talking to a group of them, and they're really confused, and, and, and they're really worried, like, where to go? And, and sort of the easy answer is, okay, get a job with a hedge fund, make a lot of money, uh, save it up, uh, you know, and hedge funds basically don't do anything except nope. push paper around, you know, <laughs> exactly to gamble. It's it, a hedge fund is is a gamble. It's, it's you know, it's 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 Las Vegas <laughs> on steroids. Uh, but it's kind of like, well, I don't know what else to do. And then and then there's other ones who will say, well, I want to get out there and, and do environmental work. But I owe two hundred thousand dollars and in, 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 in to the you know, in scholarship money. So I'm going to have to go to work for a hedge fund or some other big corporation for a few years to to pay that back and and then I and I and the, but then I'm going to go out and do what's good in the world and I, and I say to them okay that's a great idea but in the meantime you just might fall in love you might decide you want to own a house you might decide you want to have a baby uh, and you're going to get caught in this system where you'll never pay back those loans or you just keep taking on more loans and it's in fact that's designed that way it is it is yeah. it's a trap yeah I totally agree I completely agree with that and I think that the the risk is with all this is that you know, the, the, the recognizing the problem and knowing this, the solution, as you said, is the hard part. And I, and I think that if Doug were here, he would argue that the, the, the risk is that people go to the other side of this, almost of these Marxist ideas almost, you know, that they think that because the problem is this, uh, you know, predatory capitalism and, you know, especially as it's fused with, uh, you know, the government, and then it ends up with it being very, very bad for everybody except for a few, but the, you know, the alternative, it see, people jump to this you know, communist or socialist or Marxist ideas of that. And then, and, and that hasn't, hasn't worked very well, you know, either. So it's like, what's the, is there a solution that is in the middle, that, that not in the middle ground, but that is a third choice of yes. those. Hmm. I think that's, that's what we have to look for is yeah. That the American system doesn't seem to be working any longer. It's given us amazing things in the past. There's no question about it. It's been inc incredibly successful in so many ways, but it seems to have reached some sort of a, a stalemate. And this happens. It's, it happened to the Romans. It happened to the Spaniards. It's happened to all the British. It's happened to every, every empire that's come along. Mm. The Chinese are coming along and they seem to be offering their version of the solution, which is actually kind of the same thing that we were offering before with a different, with a different story. A um, better story. Yeah, and, and, and we don't want that. So what's in between? And that's actually what I'm working on the book I'm working on now, which probably won't be out for until 2022. But looking at what the Chinese are doing, looking at what we've done and where we've come from, and, and how now do we kind of reach some sort of solution that's somehow in between? And to recognize, I think an important thing here is to recognize that we humans have really become aliens. So if we if there were aliens coming down from up above, and we would probably all come together, Russians, Chinese, Brazilians, Indians, and so on and so forth, uh, to protect ourselves. And if we recognize that in a way we've, 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 we've made ourselves aliens, we've said we are apart from, not a part of nature, mm -hmm. that we have power over nature, we can do anything we want to this planet. And that's the, that's the viewpoint of an alien. It's not the viewpoint of one who is part of. It's, what, it's one who's coming from the outside in a way. We really look, I think we've come to look at ourselves that way. So for, for me, the, the hope here is that, especially the younger people, because uh, people my age and, uh, um, you know, are, we're, we're so stuck in the ways and we made horrible mistakes and we know we've created a world that isn't working well. But the younger people I hear in China, I hear in Russia, I hear all over Latin America, I hear all over the United States, they are beginning to understand that something radical needs to happen. It's a, and it's partly a change of consciousness 
a growing consciousness that we are one species. And it doesn't matter whether we're white or brown or black or whatever we are. It doesn't matter what we call our country, whether it's India, Russia, China, the United States, we are all facing a very, very serious crisis on this planet. And hopefully we're a smart, smart enough species to understand that we must come together to solve the problems that really to a very large degree, my generation has created. And I'm hoping that that's what's going to happen. And I, and I, and I, and I, have, and I do have hope because I, I do see amongst younger generations all over the world, a recognition, an awakening, if you will, to the need to touch that Jaguar, to confront that problem, not to run from it, but to really, really dig into it and say, we've got to, we the younger people, we have to do better than our parents and our grandparents who made some horrible mistakes. They did some great things and they also made some horrible mistakes. Hmm. Well, Doug, I, I, I know we lost you for a little while, Doug, but is there, I'm probably wrapping I, up here with John. I was, about, I was about to ask, well, a couple of questions. Uh, and of course, I, I agree with what you just said, John. I, I kind of, kind of echo, echo that um, with a variation. I was gonna ask you earlier before I uh, got kicked off, uh, Republicans, Democrats, blue people, red people, corporate people, government people. There's actually, I think, such a thing as the deep state where we've got like 5,000 people in the country that are top corporate executives, top bureaucrats, top congressmen, top military. And these guys really run everything. And you can forget about this idea of democracy. That's kind of a sham where the elections can be whatever they say it's gonna be. But I think the deep state, forget about the government per se or the corporations per se, guys that share the same values, have the same education, their kids go to the same country clubs and things like that. What do you think about this concept of the deep state running things for their own benefit? Yeah, I, I, that's why I like, the, I like the term corporatocracy because I think it really defines it because it's an aristocracy that comes out of corporate wealth. and. Um, uh, yeah, we have tremendous control. I think the the main, the only, I mean, they, there's a lot of values they don't share, but they they all share this one value of maximization of short-term profits, maximization of materialistic greed, basically. Uh, you know, and, and we're all brought up to, to think, well, look, if, if you've got more books behind you in that bookshelf than I've got behind me here, then you're probably... <laughs> <laughs> a smarter, <laughs> smarter no. intellectual. No, smarter this is, intellectual. No, this is, I, I apologize. I apologize. No, 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 no. What I'm I, saying I, I, is, if if I throw more passes in a football, if I complete more passes than the other quarterback, uh, I'm I'm a I, I'm a better person. If I make more money uh, than than the next guy, then I'm 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 the better executive. Uh, you know, I can be running a huge pharmaceutical company and making ten million dollars a year, but if the guy running the other huge pharmaceutical company over there is making $15 million a year, then he's better than me and I better go out and beat him at it, even though I don't, I don't need another $5 million a year. What am I gonna do with it? And I, I'm, obviously I'm, I'm, talking, I'm talking way too small numbers because it's probably more like 100 million or something. But, but the point being that we, we have a value system that says more is better, more is better. And the more is better policy has gotten us into a position where we're just consuming ourselves and ravaging our, our, our environment into a, a state where it's not going to support us any longer. I know we're basically chimpanzees and, you know, we, we've got to thump our chests and all that. That's, that's correct. But, you know, one thing that concerns me, you know, you mentioned, you know, uh, with your hope for the future getting better, it's that when you look at the 20th century, World War I, was a disaster, killed 20 million people, World War II, bigger disaster, killed maybe 80 million. And I'm afraid, and tell me if you agree, that World War III, we're gonna have one, seems like it, it's human nature, but it's gonna be a biological war and a cyber war, and may kill a whole lot more people because there's a certain coterie, like 
Ted Turner and such. I don't know if you would agree on some level or not. I, I understand him. Uh, would like to reduce the population to 500 million and maybe maybe we're going to have a bio war and maybe this COVID thing is an opening round of it. I mean, any views on that? No, <laughs> no, no, no views. I can't look, I can't, I can't, I can't look that far ahead. But, but I, you know, my, my view is that as of right now, I think we should be learning from the COVID virus that we are facing a global problem. So we've known for some time that our actions on this planet are causing problems. We know that we're killing off species. We know that we're destroying incredibly important environments. We know, at least I think most of us know, you may disagree, Doug, but that we're causing climate change. Uh, we, we know that things are happening that we could, we could have control over. But we've seen all those as local events, really, even though we may know they're big. So if a hurricane strikes me, and I survive it. I expect the outside world to come to my help, to help come to my help, bringing in bottled water and food, and then I'm going to, I'm going to rebuild. And I may, I may believe someplace up here that it's because of climate change that all these hurricanes, these once in one hundred year events, are happening every year or so. I may intellectually know that, but that's not how I feel about it. It's it's local. Well, this virus has come along and said, hey guys. It ain't local. Every human being on this planet, every living creature on this planet in one way or another has been affected by this virus. I think it may be a great gift to us if we really listen to, to tell us, listen guys, you know, like you're not gods. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't control everything. <laughs> you know, we're this tiny microscopic virus and we've beaten the hell out of you. Uh, so, you know, I think that I think you're right, though, that the idea that things are going to keep happening to us, we may be able to think that we can get rid of diseases by creating antibiotics and so on. And when we do, we get rid of some of them, but then something comes along like this virus. And I think that'll keep happening until we understand that we have to be symbiotic. We have to have a symbiotic relationship with our planet. I don't disagree with that, but at the same time, I think we have to recognize that it wasn't so long ago that we, humans were beating on earth with a stick and putting two stones on top of each other and that was the best we could do. But with a little bit of luck and the accumulation of capital, we'll be colonizing the asteroids and the planets and uh, eventually uh, other stars in the solar system. If you wanna be an optimist and I, at heart, although I'm a gloom and doom guy for the near term with the economy and everything else, for the long term, I'd like to be an optimist that way. Well, that's good. That's probably a good ending note because I am going to have to get off in a yeah. few minutes. But uh, yeah, I think, you know, optimism is certainly more fun than pessimism. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, I think we can all agree on that. <laughs> and and let's just hope it's not blind optimism. No. And I'll tell you what has been fun and enjoyable. It's meeting you and, and talking to you, John. So I hope we can do it again at some point in the future, maybe a year from now when we see how things have panned out. Who knows? Yes. Yeah, when, you're, yes. well, when, your, when your book comes out on uh, you know, China's economic hitman, I'd love to, uh, you know, to, to have you on to talk about that and you know, help promote it, um, you know, despite what Zuckerberg might think about it. Uh, but I'd like to help get that out there, get that promoted for you. So. Yeah, please come back. And again, you're, you're, I encourage everyone to, uh, first of all, you know, check out John's books. He's written a lot of them, uh, you know, the, some on economics, some on indigenous uh, uh, civilizations and, um, or peoples, I'd say. And, uh, and you also have a, a newsletter. You have a, a website. I believe it's, it's your name.org, right? Johnperkins.org. If people can go and sign up and get on your newsletter list. Yes, that's excellent. And, and that way, uh, Matt, you'll also know when the next book comes out because it'll <laughs> we'll certainly announce it on that newsletter. It's about once a month we do a newsletter on johnperkins.org. Yeah. Awesome. I signed, I signed up for it today. So, so did oh, I. Thank you. So did I. So I encourage everyone to do that. Thank you, John. I really appreciate you being here and uh, well, hope to talk to you in soon. Thank you. I, I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. I think opening all this dialogue up. And as I said earlier, I think, Doug, you and I have disagreed on some points. And I think that's so important. I, I, it's, it's so important that, that I hear 
views that are different from mine and that you do. And, and that's what we were saying about so, one of the problems with social media. So the fact that you guys are bringing us out here and, and having people have these kinds of dialogues is so essential. And I just deeply, deeply appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you, John. I appreciate that.